Welcome back to Light the Fuse, your one-stop shop, really for all Mission Impossible, Top Gun Maverick, occasionally Color of Night uh, information, <laughs> and um, yep, we're here to talk about uh, a different version of the first Mission Impossible, but before that, I mean, we got to talk about something coming up next week, Charles. Yeah, you know... Um... We weren't sure last week if we were what what was going to happen for the two hundredth, uh, but we uh, we've recorded it now, and uh, I think it's I think it's pretty good. I think people are going to be pleased. I think so. I don't know how you could not be pleased. That's how confident I am. In this <laughs> not again. Nothing that we did. Yeah. So excited for everybody to hear the two hundredth. You're all going to love it, and uh, I, I I think that's all we should say. I think we should get into this week's episode yes um and so you know obviously robert town came into this movie his uh and robert town's resume uh speaks for itself he wrote chinatown and shampoo and the last detail and he worked with Cruz before this on uh, days of thunder and the firm he was kind of Cruz's guy in the 90s yeah he worked with him after this too so oh right because he, he did he wrote mission he's the he's one of the i think he's the main credited writer on mission impossible 2 right i think he's the only credited writer I think there's a story by credit, and then yeah, so yeah, because Ron, uh, Ronald Moore and uh, and Brandon Braga were the uh, they they ended up with story credit, and we've had Ron Moore on the show. Obviously, that was a great episode. You should check it out if you haven't listened. Uh, but yeah, so Robert Town, unbelievable, amazing screenwriter. He came in, so the whole process started. We know that Steven Zalian. Uh, who wrote Schindler's List and uh, many other amazing movies. Uh, he and De Palma did the initial outline together. And then David Kep wrote the first drafts of the script. Uh, two of them are on his website, dated November 7th, 1994, and December 12th, 1994. So soon after that December 12th draft, Robert Town comes on board because his draft is dated February 28th, 1995. And that's what we're going to talk about today. And uh, and then as we've heard from both Kep and De Palma in our interviews with them, Kep returned to write the final shooting script that is also on his website dated August 16th, 1995, which is right before production started. So today we're talking about Town's draft and what he changed from Kep's early drafts. Do you want to talk about where you got this draft? Well, we I think we've talked about it before on the show, but Chris Saldo was the assistant director for the first movie the first ad for the first movie and we we interviewed him uh, a few months back and he tracked this thing down we kept hounding him about it because he had mentioned that he had it on a disc somewhere around and so he got it on like an old it wasn't even a floppy disc i think it was like an old hard disc that can't really be read anymore but he had it somebody a friend of his uh, get it transferred and so we had it as this very basic text file that was a complete and utter mess, and I had to go through and reformat it as a screenplay. Uh, so <laughs> that's how we got the file, and that's what why we're here now to talk about. I can't wait. Uh, I can't are you wait. so are you ready to start? I, I want to employ your acting skills here every once in a while, just sure. to spice things up. If you're sure. okay with that, absolutely. Okay. <laughs> um, but before we get started, I obviously have to uh, give a shout out, like my, my trademark shout outs to Jeremy Dillon. And his podcast, My Favorite Album, as well as John B. Uh, and Elvis Ripley. So thank you guys so much for all of your continued support. So we ready to get into it, Charles? Yeah, let's do this, man. You okay. ready? Should we I'm do? Ready. Should we do the? Should we do the plot theme and bring us into the into the beginning of the movie or something? Yeah, is, is Kevin around? Kevin, hit it. Okay. Magnificent. So, Magnificent. Okay. The movie opens. It's a it's a very similar setup to the to the final movie where Jack is in a closet watching on a monitor, but in this version Claire is pretending to be a flight attendant. She's in a room with a pilot named Sergey, and she has some Walkmans and other items because her boyfriend Georgie, who's currently out of town, is a black market gangster. The pilot Sergey brags that he smuggles plutonium, and Claire is about to hook up with him when the boyfriend Georgie suddenly shows up angry with a gun. Claire kisses him and tells him Sergey is just a friend. But he says, get away from me, you lying bitch. And Claire manages to get the gun and then shoots Georgie dead. And he lands so that his face is right up against the camera lens, which is hidden in the TV. Claire tells the pilot Georgie's friends will kill them unless they give them, uh, unless they give them Sergei's contact, who he gets plutonium for. 
So Sergei gives up the info rather easily and then leaves. And that's when Georgie is revealed to not be dead and he takes off his mask to reveal Ethan Hunt. So they start wrapping up their equipment and uh, Ethan pulls Claire aside to say, What was your tongue doing down my throat? Ethan, I was just acting. If you keep on acting like this, I'm going to end up sleeping with you or you're going to end up sleeping with me and we'll both end up screwing my boss and your husband. You're driving me nuts and he's all I've got that keeps me sane. Great. <laughs> yeah, that's kind of a weird that's kind of a weird thing to say. But. It is. It's a pretty intense line. I can I can sort of imagine Cruz giving it in a really intense way and I, you know. But yeah, the, some of this a lot of this Robert Town dialogue is is uh is pretty intense. Some of it is i sexist purposefully maybe sometimes i don't know but we'll, we'll see so like well the other thing is that sergey has been an ethan hunt alias before or actually since do you know when yeah in, in ghost protocol that's what yeah. bogdan calls him sergey Serg, you are not sergey <laughs> but i think in this he was georgie oh who- sergey was the guy they were tricking oh okay so then uh, uh, Jax enters and he spots Ethan and they have a little banter that's not so great. Uh, Jack says, uh, your time of the month, sweetie. More like menopause, wise ass. Come on, let's get out of here. I, are we really going to break down the script in this excruciating <laughs> detail? That's really my question. Uh, yeah, let's keep going. Okay, great. <laughs> Kep's version of this opening scene in the previous draft is pretty close to what's in the final movie. So Town tried something different, and De Palma and I assume Cruz liked what Kep did better. However, Kep had it in a different order. He opened the movie with Phelps on the airplane getting the mission briefing, and he had the mission in Kiev as the second scene. So Town's reordering one out. Uh, second scene, now, so now the airplane scene is pretty close to the final movie, but it was already in Kep's draft before this. So Town just carried it over. The code between Jim and the flight attendant, the whole, you know, would you consider the cinema of the Ukraine, perhaps? That was all Kep. Uh, Town did add one bit at the end of the scene that doesn't end up in the movie, where after Phelps lights up a cigarette to disguise the mission briefing self-destructing, a flight attendant says, there's no smoking on this flight. And Phelps says, sorry, I forgot. Pretty pretty uh, crucial little thing that uh, thankfully didn't end up in there. Uh, so then the safe house scene is kind of similar, but with some new wrinkles, starting with a really weird detail. Jack is on a computer playing a video game he created called Mission Impossible. And it says, see if you can beat the odds, qualify for America's dream team, complete with little animated IMF team members trying to complete their mission without getting knocked off. It's pretty weird. I'm sure Robert Town was playing a lot of video games. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, the safe house scene is mostly Phelps trying to convince Ethan to do the mission because Ethan wants to leave and go on vacation instead. In Kep's draft, Phelps convinces Ethan to do the mission when he's picking him up at the airport. Obviously, neither version of these scenes made it into the movie. I think they actually shot a version of the scene in the kitchen of the safe house, but then did that reshoot that George Lucas suggested, which we found out in our De Palma interview. So Town carried over Kep's work of the senator on TV, you know, the line, the, the we were living in a democracy the last time I checked. That's that's carried over from Kep and Jack showing Ethan the red light, green light, bubble gum. That's all in Kep's December draft. Wait, how, how do we know which, which? OK, so this is I've been this is this is I've done crazy amounts of work on this. I, Kep's drafts are on his website. So I was cross referencing. Oh, OK. But you but you knew that this one was this one was dated. Yes, th- this script was dated February of 95 from Chris okay. Soldo. He had it handwritten on the thing. <laughs> um, so, yeah, that, that's how we know. And I think it was on the, in the file, too, as well. The date was written in there as well. Okay. So, yeah, this is, that's the order. It was what, what, what officially, at least I don't know how many drafts Kep did, but what Kep has on his website, he has three drafts. Draft one and draft two were before this. Then it was this draft by town, and then Kep did the shooting draft after this. Wow. So the... the... Tennis match has begun between yeah. these two. Okay. All right. <laughs> and then as, you know, as Kep told us, he had to like combine stuff that he did with with Towns draft. And then that's how they came to what the final version is. So it, it's weird because I told Kep that we got this and he was like, yeah, it's weird, isn't it? It's 76 pages. But this draft is super long, right? Yeah, it's 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 definitely more than 76 pages. OK, but maybe what, see, what I want. I have a theory about that. I wonder if De Palma took and maybe Cruz too took. Towns draft went through it and just deleted the sections they didn't like. Mm. And they might have just given Kep, these are the 70 pages we like. Use this stuff. Okay. That's, Interesting. That's my theory. Okay. So anyway, we get to the Prague mission. It's pretty close to what's in the final movie, uh, but it was also in Kep's previous draft, so it wasn't Towns work. Uh, little things like, you know, mark the package and go to two. That was that was Kep. 
Spraying Glitzen's head is the same, but Hannah is not in this script, so it's actually Claire wearing the special ga glasses to track him. The whole suspenseful bit with the guards checking Sarah's ID and Ethan and Sarah saying things teasingly about Jack, none of that is in this. Also, Ethan saying the date with Sarah is definitely off and Sarah saying such a nice ass, all that stuff. None of that is in this. Kep adds that later in the shooting script. Jack's death is basically the same, carried over from Kep's previous draft. Same with Phelps going to the bridge and his line, I've got a shadow, that's Kep. But Town added the car exploding with an IMF team member in it. It's a little different because Ethan is close enough to the explosion that it actually knocks him into a wall. Ethan finds Sarah and Glitzen dead, but in this he actually finds an IMF headset on Glitzen, uh, which is weird. And Town adds the drunken uh, Russian couple who later end up being IMF agents. Except in this, they actually shoot at Ethan in this moment because they think he killed Glitzen. And in this draft, Ethan escapes by stealing the police boat. Now, the police boat is actually kind of interesting because the script describes the next scene of Ethan running to a phone booth with the boat in the background. And if you watch the final movie, there's a boat in the background when he runs to the phone booth. And if you look closely enough, it's the same police boat. So in the final movie, I don't know if they filmed the phone booth scene first and then decided they didn't want him to steal the police boat, or maybe they ran out of time to film him taking the police boat, so they just had him jump over that gate and run away. But the next time you watch the first movie, look closely at the police boat. And, and then look at the boat in the background of the phone booth scene because they're the same boat. I think I always tracked that boat behind him in the... Yeah, it's lit. I mean, they like specifically lit that boat in the background. And then right. I just, but look closely, it's the same as the police boat that shows up. So I think in an earlier version of shooting, they had him steal that police boat. Wow, okay. So we have the phone booth dialogue. That's carried over from Kep's previous draft and same as the final movie, except Ethan's call sign isn't Bravo Echo 1-1, it's Bravo Edward 1-1 different slightly the aquarium restaurant scene this is a very different in the first half town adds a lot of discussion about ethan's dad ethan talks about how his dad was a farmer who worked from dawn to dusk every day but he was always so clean he says when i was a kid i thought he was a sissy he was always so clean and smelled so good hell i couldn't fall off the porch without getting covered with shit they go back and forth about his dad and ethan says anyway it all boils down to this i was proud to be my father's son i can't imagine being proud to be my son and that's what leads Kittredge into saying, what do you have to be ashamed of in a pointed way, making Ethan realize that Kittredge thinks he killed off his IMF team. It's not nearly as good as the way it is in the final movie, but the famous line, Kittredge, you've never seen me very upset, is in here. That was town. And uh, Ethan circles back to his dad again in a very corny line. My father was in the business of growing things, not killing them, feeding people food, not lies. Jim Phelps was no farmer, but by some miracle, he was as decent as my father. And as long as he was alive, I could go to work. Uh, this is weird. The the <laughs> like why he loves Phelps so much is bizarre. Yes. Well, I think they're really trying to get bring in this Phelps as the father figure. Um. Yes. So, anyway, then the stuff about Max and Job three fourteen are carried over from Kep's previous draft, and the gum explosion escape was carried over as well. But Town added the whole idea of the second IMF team. So the Russian couple and the you know see if you can follow me around the room. Bow tie, 12 o'clock, all that stuff. The other IMF agents who are at the embassy and then are in new disguises at the aquarium restaurant, that's all town. Also, that line, this whole operation was a mole hunt, also town. Okay. So, back to the safe house is the same. Uh, town adds a moment where Ethan uses infrared goggles to check outside the window, but nobody's out there. All he sees is a cat hanging around some trash cans. Also, when Ethan first goes on the computer, Jack's video game pops back up, and all the IMF team members are dead. There's a computer voice repeating, oh, oh, too bad you blew your cover, IMF team member. You bite the dust. Ha ha. Doesn't that seem very uh, Jurassic Park with the Nedry? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I'm glad we didn't. We don't have to. I'm, yeah. There's enough bad stuff that, that dated poorly with the Internet. I'm glad that we didn't have this video game. In no, here too. no. Uh, so Kep's earlier version had Ethan figuring out Job 314 pretty close to how it is in the final movie, but Town changed it in this draft. He has Ethan searching the internet, and at the same time, CNN is on the TV in the background. After a report about the killings at the embassy, there's a segment about Sunday school kids who quote different Bible scriptures. That's what makes Ethan think of Job 314, which is just not nearly as good. It's so good in the movie when it's just visual and you have the Bible in the bookcase behind him. Anyway, the, uh, the Dream of Phelps, which turns out to be Claire, uh, that's carried over from Kep. But the dialogue between Ethan and Claire is totally different. It doesn't quite land as hard. Kep's previous draft was also different from the final movie and didn't quite land either. So that means when Kep returned after this draft, it looks like he took another crack at this scene to get it to where it ended up. Uh, next sequence, Ethan getting picked up by Max's goons. 
pretty similar to the final movie, but not as succinct. They actually jab his thigh with a tranquilizer after a much longer exchange. The, uh, the line, something of a paradox, that whole exchange, that's new to this draft, along with some other lines. So that means that was town. And one of my favorite lines, too, uh, this is also town, boot it up, and in anywhere from 30 seconds to 10 minutes, you'll have Virginia farm boys hopping around you like jackrabbits. That is such a Robert Town line. Yeah, I thought I thought Kep said that that was you know one of his lines. Maybe I'm misremembering, but yeah, that is very towny. Yeah, uh, the entire first scene with Max is done with Ethan covered by the black hood, and Max speaks through a mechanical device and coughs a few times, implying that it's a man with throat cancer or something like that. Then after they escape, before Kittredge and Barnes show up. Finally, Max pulls the hood off of Ethan, revealing Max to be, quote, a tall, elegant woman of indeterminate age. In Kep's draft before this, Ethan's mask comes off way earlier and Max is a man. So I don't know if it was Town's idea, but his draft is the one who changes Max to a woman. That's interesting. I mean, that's a good change. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. It's, it's just interesting, like little lines here and there where you're like, oh, that's Kep, that's Town, that's Kep, that's Town. Like it's. Right. It's just, <laughs> so this, is, this is more of a revision than a new script. Yes. It's like the whole structure, the framework is there. Every scene is the, almost the same, but it's just all new dialogue. This is the multi. We're in the multiverse of madness. Right now, <laughs> looking at this. Mission Impossible multiverse of madness. It is. Um, all right. So then, also in Town's draft, he gives her because uh, he has the line, "Thanks, Max," or is it Maxine? And then she says, "It's Clementine, actually." Okay. <laughs> not so, not great. <laughs> not great. So then the Kittredge Barnes conversation after this is totally different. Capped. You want to be? You want to do Kittredge? Sure, I'll do Kittredge. All right. Capped off with this exchange. This is where it ends. Okay, I told Hunt the knock list he stole from the embassy was dirty, but he went ahead and tried to lay it on Max anyway. Talk about arrogant. I mean, does he think Max is going to sit still for being stiffed? He's not dealing with a bunch of candy asses like us. Max will kill him before we ever catch up to him. Ethan Hunt's a dead man, believe me. It's just a matter of where or whether. Where or whether? I'm Barnes, by the way. (laughs) The body shows up. Oh... That line is terrible. I don't like yes. that at all. Yeah. And Kep's draft previous to this is almost word for word what ended up in the movie, which is the awesome line where he's like, you know, the you pick your pressure points and you squeeze. Yes. Like that, that's the that's what they went back to. So, you know, Town tried something different and they just didn't go for it. Well, that, you know, that squeeze line is actually almost word for word in The Gray Man, which is opening this weekend. Really? Yeah. And I was like, oh. Somebody watched Mission Impossible before they wrote this script or during, <laughs> during production or something. Who delivers but, it? Who, de- who tries to deliver it, I should I say? Think, I think Evans does because he's the psychopath. Um, yeah. Okay. But I remember right. just like, ding. So when you watch it, tell me. <laughs> Your alarm bells went off. We, yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll look at it on, <laughs> on Netflix. But anyway, go All ahead. All right. So the scene after that between Ethan and Claire has completely different dialogue. They're running through the plan going forward when Ethan interrupts her to say... Okay, let's spell it out. For months now, you've been driving me nuts. At times, it's been all I could do to keep my hands to myself, and I wouldn't be surprised if it hasn't been something like that for you. Care to argue with me? All right, now I'm Claire. No, if Jim had lived, I'm sure we would have cheated on him and had a fine time for a while, making love and hating ourselves. But Jim's dead, and we're too full of guilt for the pleasure we never had. So it's over before it began. We agree? And from that, Ethan's impressed and annoyed, and then Claire says... You wish to find Jim's killers, as do I. So let's get out of here. Terrible. Terrible. <laughs> All right. So next, there's a new sequence where they recruit Krieger. So Kep had these recruiting scenes as well, uh, like the awesome prison breakout we covered in our episode about Oliver Stone's MI2. You should listen to that if you haven't. Uh, but in this, Town does his own thing completely. So Claire talks with Krieger on a cargo boat, but when Krieger sees Ethan, he says he wants no part of it because Ethan is a wanted man. Ethan and Krieger physically fight. Ethan holds him over the railing and finally convinces him by saying they'll pay him a lot of money. Not the best scene. Then they rescue Staff Sergeant Luther K. McNeil from, I guess, some kind of army prison or something. Uh, Kep had Luther Stickle in his draft, but Town tried to change his last name to McNeil for some reason. So Luther has befriended, in this uh, in this uh, town version, Luther has befriended a goat in this prison, and there's an attempt at comedy with the goat making sounds because it's hungry. Ethan gives Luther a laptop to disable the ankle monitor that he has on, and while that's happening, the goat gets worked up. Luther asks if they have anything to feed him. Ethan asks, like what? And Luther says, you want to be Luther? Sure. 
He's a goat. He'll eat anything. Don't eat him first. Okay, so in this version, Luther is like a southerner or something. <laughs> so let me let me try that again. He's a goat. He'll eat anything. Don't eat him first. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> okay. Perfect. Okay, so they end up feeding the goat some Folgers coffee crystals. Then they put Luther's anklet on the goat's collar as the like uh, you know uh, <laughs> to, to help them escape. Right. right, uh, right. So all right. So then they they run through after this to get the crew together. Everybody's together. They run through the Langley security system, and that's pretty similar to what's in the final movie and Kep's previous draft. Except in this, they're not on the train; they're on Krieger's boat. So after running through the security system, there's there's not much about how impossible it'll be. They don't have the line, you know, you really think we can do this? We're going to do it. That's not in the movie. So Kep must add that later because it's not even in his previous drafts. And interestingly, the we're going to do it that Ethan delivers isn't even in the shooting script. So I don't know. That came in much later while they were shooting, I guess. Wow. Um, in all these drafts, there's a scene right after this before the Langley heist with Claire and Ethan sleeping together for the first time. We know from one of our talks with editor Paul Hirsch, they actually filmed that scene and cut it out in the edit. Kep's version of the scene is pretty simple. Ethan's worried about Claire, gives her a passport, and tells her to walk away if anything goes wrong. Then they can't help themselves. Scandalous. Um, they sleep together. Now, Town's version is much longer and goes as follows. Claire goes to bed in the boat stateroom, and Ethan asks to join her. They talk about Phelps for a bit. Ethan says he's having dreams about him, and he feels guilty. He says when things went wrong in Prague, he didn't run to the bridge, he ran to the car. So he went to save her instead of Phelps. They end up kissing passionately. Then she wants to stop. He tries to press on, but then stops and apologizes. And as he's about to leave, she, she attacks him passionately and says, uh, don't you dare leave me. And then they sleep together. So it's a little, a little aggressive, a little more aggressive the way the town did it. Yeah. So in all these drafts, they, they sleep together, both Kep and Town. But then this part is only in Town's draft. Later that night, Ethan leaves the stateroom, and Claire sits up, turns on a light, and surprise, Phelps enters. He asks, how'd it go? And she says, as planned. They don't talk long before she says he should probably go. Things seem a little tense between them, understandably so. Creepy Phelps and all, asking her to sleep with Ethan. So, uh, so Town basically tried to move up the reveal to the audience that Phelps is the bad guy and Claire is in on it with him. Moved it up to this point in the movie, before Langley. Um, and they didn't, uh, you know, they didn't go for it, obviously, because it's not in the shooting script. But you know what's interesting? With the scene of Ethan and Claire sleeping together, that means there was a version of the movie in the edit that didn't have the, the whole, you know... Um, what Ethan goes, we're going to do it. And then the hard cut to Langley with Danny Elfman's Mission Impossible theme kicking in. Like, that's that moment is so incredible. I can't imagine the movie without it. And they must have put that together in the edit, cutting out the part where Ethan and Claire sleep together and just doing that hard cut. Um, yeah, I mean, that. there's a shot from that sequence in the trailer of them sleeping together. Yeah, yeah. I just, I, I mean, the, the dialogue in this version is so bad and there's just so much of it. And we know how visual... De Palma is and how Kep was very much in that same wavelength. Yeah. And I think De Ke I think Kep's dialogue is just infinitely better than what ended up in this draft. Yeah, I think largely, but some of the best lines, I mean, also, just to give Ket Town some credit, some of the lines I've pointed out, you know, like you are something of a paradox and stuff, stuff like whatever, it depends on whether you like a paradox, that kind of stuff. That there's some good lines in there from Town too, or the Kitchers you've never seen me very upset. That that's, that's town. true. That's He's true. got some good ones. Just, you know, come into town's defense a little bit. But I think yeah. you're right. Kep was really the the carrying most of the weight here. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, so in, in the final cut, when, when they cut out them sleeping together before Langley, it's implied that they don't sleep together until right before the climax of the movie. It's just it's interesting change there. Yeah. Uh, anyway, so Langley. Um, the scene with Kittredge is carried over from Kep's draft and pretty close to the final version. This is like another great... I mean, part of this is Henry Cerny and how amazing he is. But you know the scene that ends with the fire alarm and Kittredge annoyed. Yeah. Well, do we have to evacuate? <laughs> That's all. That's in Kep's earlier drafts. Uh, the whole sequence of breaking into Langley is pretty much carried over from Kep's draft and pretty close to the final version. The end of it, though, doesn't have the knife falling moment, which is, you know, when when uh, when Krieger comes in and grabs the disc and then drops the knife. It's such an amazing moment. Remember when we saw it in the theater last year for the 25th anniversary and people were gasping? Yes. God. And it was made on uh, John Knoll's home computer or whatever, too, right? Yeah. The knife, yeah. Yeah, that's right. The knife's been, yeah. John Knoll told us about that. Um, I just, it, so they came up with that during production, I guess. Amazing. 
Um, okay, so uh, also there's an extra bit where Luther keeps asking Ethan what their exit strategy is because they had to leave their IDs at the front desk when they entered in disguise as firefighters. And Luther's like, what's going to happen when they realize the IDs are fake? So after they get the knock list, Claire goes into a receptionist's office and gives an envelope to the woman, asking her in a perfect American accent to give it to Kittredge. The envelope is delivered to Kittredge, and it's a memo telling him that someone using Jim Phelps' passport entered the country through Dulles Airport 20 minutes ago. In response to that, Kittredge initiates a code yellow, which forces all non-essential personnel to exit Langley, and that's their exit strategy. That's all from Kep's previous draft, and Town kept it in this one. Um, and that hilarious scene... Oh my God, one of my favorite scenes when, where Kittredge says, I want him manning a radar tower in Alaska by the end of the day. Just mail him his clothes. You know that scene? Yeah. That's not in this draft or any previous one. So Kep adds that in the shooting script in his next round of rewrites. Wow. Next couple of scenes are pretty similar to the final version, although for some reason, Town changed Kittredge's first name from Eugene to Alan. Okay. I don't know why. He picks up the phone and says, Go ahead. This is Alan Kittredge. And Ethan replies, Are you sure? I thought it was major asshole. Like that's his like military title is major asshole. Uh, yeah, I guess because he's saying that my name's Alan Kittredge and the line is I thought it was major asshole. It's not. Yeah, I don't know. It's not the best. It's not the best <laughs> line. So uh, also in Kep's uh, previous draft, it's Ethan's parents who get framed. So Town is the one who kills off Ethan's dad and makes it Ethan's mom and Uncle Donald who get framed. Okay. So like it seems like town I feel like Cruz got town on board and was like we need to make this more about like some of his daddy issues, Ethan's daddy issues. Mm. Uh, and he like killed off the dad and made it this whole thing. Anyway, all right. So, Kitter's just talking to Ethan on the phone. He runs through the names of the agents who he thinks Ethan killed in Prague and includes the name Claire Phelps, saying she blew up in the exit vehicle. Ethan asks how they ID'd Claire and Kittredge says, "Dental records. I've got them right here on my desk. We can go over them." Filling by filling, if you'd like. And you can tell your little playmate, Caroline Davies, will cut her a deal, too. Who? It's confusing because earlier in the script, her name was Sarah Davies, which is what it is in the final movie. So I don't know what happened there. But some of these names were changing through the process, I guess. For, okay. for one scene, Mitnick was part of the team, and he is not in the rest of the script at all. <laughs> and uh, he was in previous drafts. So I think stuff just gets accidentally carried over sometimes. Anyway, Ethan responds with... Go ahead. That might be difficult. Telling Caroline anything falls under the category of Mission Impossible. Sorry, out of dimes, gotta go. <laughs> That's when he hangs up the phone before Kittredge can get a trace. Uh, so this version doesn't have that great part where Kittredge kind of grinds his teeth and says he wanted us to know he was in London. You know, that, that comes later in Kept Shooting Draft. So some of this yeah. dialogue's not so great. Well, it also takes away the... I mean, is Ethan looking at the clock, too, on the wall? Because that's also great. Like, you know, in, in the train station, he's seeing it, like, tick by. Yeah, he's just in a pub in this version. Oh, yeah, that's yeah. Way, way less interesting. <laughs> so next up, uh, Town created an early version of the Amazing... So you got to give Town a little bit of credit here, although I think I remember hearing that it was Town and Cruz that were working on this together. Town created an early version of the Amazing Sequence where Phelps is lying to Ethan, but we see the truth in flashbacks. It's simpler and shorter, and it's in a London flat instead of at that cafe at Liverpool Street Station. But uh, the, the way Kep had it before this, when Phelps lies to Ethan, we actually see a flashback of the lie. So you see Kittredge in, in Kep's draft. You saw Kittredge in the fog being the bad guy in Prague. They oh, showed that's interesting. You, yeah, they showed you Phelps's lie. Um, and so it's very different. And so, you know, we've heard before, it was like Cruz that worked on this sequence with Town. So, you know, this is his first in the town draft is that that uh, I love that. I know it confused people, but I don't care. It's so fucking great. <laughs> yeah. Um, now here's where it gets pretty interesting. Claire comes home with groceries and drops them on the floor in shock when she sees Phelps. So it's like, he's not hiding from Claire like he does in the final movie. And in this version, it's already revealed to the audience that she's in on it with Phelps. So we know she's just pretending. Anyway, Phelps, Claire and Ethan sit down for a dinner. They do a toast to the three of us and to nailing Job. Then Ethan has a quick meeting with Max at another pub to set up the exchange on the Eurostar train. Meanwhile, Claire and Phelps talk about the possibility of Ethan having found out about them faking Claire's death, but they're not sure if he talked with Kittredge directly, so they don't know. And Claire says, either way, he gets on the train, we'll find out then. And so it's like, it's just, it's just so much, there's so much like, 
Uh, it's just, it's, it's a, it gets pretty kind of sweaty in this section. Like it just, they did a lot of cut, running around. Yeah. They cut so much out of this and it was just like the, it, you know, efficiency of the storytelling is so much better in the final movie. Anyway, in this version, um, Ethan saw the stamp in the Bible that said Drake hotel in the same spot as in the final movie, but there's no mention of the Drake hotel at the beginning of the movie to set that up. So the stamp in the Bible is kind of now the setup instead of the payoff. And the way he figured, the way Ethan figures it out is he sees Phelps here in a bathrobe that has Drake Hotel stitched onto it. So like I think though it's like it, the, the setup and the payoff are like pretty close to each other. It's done so much better in the final movie. Like I feel like having it set up at the beginning with that toss off line from Phelps is just more casual and natural. Yeah, that's a lot better. So next uh, sequence, Phelps drops them off at the train and says he'll be waiting on the French side with half of Interpol backing him up. He kisses Claire goodbye and then Ethan and Claire have an exchange about whether they should tell Phelps about their affair. Claire says she loves Ethan, so she has to tell him, but Ethan says they can't. He says this line. I love my father. I can't stop loving him just because he's dead. But you get used to it, loving someone you'll never see again. And then Claire starts to cry. So you see, there's a lot of more like dad stuff in here in this in the town draft. It's so maudlin. It's not. Yeah. It doesn't work for me, um, at least. Yeah. yeah. No, I mean, the final is better. Um, Kittredge gets the package from Ethan at London IMF headquarters, but in this version, he speculates to Barnes that Caroline Davies sent them this package. He says maybe she developed pangs of conscience. Mr. Hunt could be in for a surprise. So uh, it's just like it's just way more complicated. And then, okay, so as they get on the train, Ethan tricks the conductor and reprograms the train to go 130 miles per hour instead of 100 miles per hour before the English side of the channel. Kittredge and Barnes get on the train. Max and her goon get on as well. And we see the train pull out of the station. Phelps and Claire talk over some kind of radio to say neither of them has seen any sign of Ethan. Krieger is on the train in the second class dining car dressed as a waiter. Krieger alerts Claire and Phelps over the radio that Kittredge and Barnes are in first class. Claire is in disguise as an older woman to not be spotted by them. So you remember De Palma was talking about how Town wanted to do all this stuff on the train. Yeah. There's a lot of stuff on the train. <laughs> so Kittredge and Barnes yeah. come across a man in an obvious wig with a laptop. Barnes rips off the wig, and it turns out it's just a very angry, very bald English businessman. It's kind of a funny moment. Uh, by the way, in, uh, in this version, Luther's not on the train at all. And in the previous draft, Kep had Krieger in the helicopter, like in the final movie. But in Town's draft, Krieger is here on the train. So now Kittredge and Barnes and Claire are all looking for Max and Ethan. None of them know what Max looks like. They get to a forward first class car and there's an elegant Frenchman teaching 20 odd passengers in a computer class. They all have laptops and this guy's giving them a lesson in high speed modeming off a high speed train. So Barnes and Kittredge are freaking out because any one of these people could be Max transmitting the knock list to God knows who. Then Phelps and Claire get into a fight over the radio while Phelps is assembling that special gun he has in the final movie. Phelps says Claire needs to contact Ethan so they can identify Max, otherwise they'll lose the money and the list. Claire says Ethan swore he would get in touch the moment the exchange takes place, which leads to this heated exchange. Phelps says, Maybe Ethan's lying. Maybe you haven't been as convincing with Ethan as he has with you. Or should I say, persuasive. And Claire responds with, Then maybe you shouldn't place your wife in the hands of a man who can be that persuasive. Ooh. Yikes. <laughs> Ooh. So, so then there's some suspense over getting the transmission done in the next 23 minutes before they enter the channel. Kittredge and Barnes are looking at the 20 computer screens to see if the knock list shows up in any of them. Ethan calls Max and tells her the disc is in a Velcro pocket, like in the final movie. Krieger switches to street clothes, and the head waiter gets mad at him, so Krieger karate chops the guy's Adam's apple, crushing his windpipe, and stuffs him in a refrigerator. He meets up with Claire, and over the radio, Phelps tells him to take Claire hostage and bring her to the back of the train to lure Ethan. So Claire radios Ethan, and Krieger interjects to tell Ethan to meet them in three minutes for a trade. The money for Claire. Then the train's speed picks up, causing problems for everyone. Max's transfer won't go through in time, and Phelps says they can't get off the train at the speed. So Phelps moves to a car in the back to manually apply the brakes. Claire and Krieger meet Phelps in the baggage car. Krieger's still holding a gun to Claire's neck. That leads to some more dicey, sexist dialogue, this time for Krieger. Um, do we want to read it or no? <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll be Krieger. Go ahead. Okay, I'll, I'll be Claire. This, this is dicey. Take this, so she's talking about the gun. Take this damn thing out of my neck. You probably would have been more comfortable with it in your mouth. Ooh. Ooh. I like the French accent, though. Yeah. Uh, I'm not, and then Claire says, I'm not so sure he cares how. So there's a little bit of mix up here. I think Town maybe 
had some things here that he he has two Claire lines in a row, so I think something got cut. Hopefully he had Claire maybe try to fight back a little bit more, but he has two lines in a row from Claire that don't make sense. I'm not so sure he cares how I talk to you. Uh, and then Claire says, Jim, look, I'm sorry we quarreled. What's got into you? And then Krieger says, Undoubtedly, what got into you? Ooh. Ooh. So some... some uh, Gross dialogue there from Krieger. Yeah. Uh, then the door opens and a second Phelps enters. So we've got our second Phelps. Um, Krieger threatens to shoot them both if Ethan doesn't reveal himself. Ethan pulls off his mask and reveals himself. In Kep's previous drafts, Ethan never disguised himself as Phelps on the train. So that idea came from town, which is pretty cool. Um, but Kep milks it really well on the shooting script with how Ethan tricks Claire, you know, when he's sitting there in the boxcar and letting Claire implicate herself. Yeah. That's not, so Town brought in the idea of the two Phelpses, but, but I think Kep really brought it home. Uh, anyway, back to Town. Ethan pulls off the Phelps mask and lays out everything that Phelps did to him. And Phelps says, why are you telling me this? And then they reveal he's got the eyeglasses with the camera. And Kittredge and Barnes are watching in Barnes's open suitcase. Not sure how that works, but there's... No special watch in this. The watch was in Kep's previous draft and in the final movie, but Town, for some reason, tried to replace it with them watching it in a briefcase instead. I don't know why. So Kep also wrote uh, the, the great line, Kittredge's line, when, he, when Kittredge sees him and says, good morning, Mr. Phelps, which is so good. I can't believe Town tried to cut that out, but um, he tried and failed, thankfully for us. So anyway, uh, Phelps grabs the glasses and stomps on them. Krieger grabs Phelps' gun and asks for the money, which is weirdly on a... The money is kept on a disc for some reason. Another disc. Uh, Ethan has Krieger step forward to get it, and then Ethan wrestles the gun away. The disc goes flying, and Phelps grabs it and bolts. Claire tries to leave with him, but he knocks her to the ground. So Phelps is like, peace out. I'm not bringing Claire with me. Uh, while Ethan is struggling with Krieger, Claire shoots Krieger. Oh. Now... Phelps finally goes on the roof of the train, and surprise, Luther is the one driving the helicopter to pick him up. So for some reason, Town wanted to make Luther the, the, the helicopter guy. And he's like, oh, hey, I'm here from southern Kentucky. <laughs> but also, he changed his last name to McNeil, so is he Irish? Oh, maybe. <laughs> uh, Ethan climbs onto the roof and battles Phelps, and this is all pretty close to what ends up in the final movie. Which is pretty interesting because we always heard the town didn't want to do the action sequence on the roof of the train. My guess is De Palma had already won this battle, and so town had to work from his storyboards and put this in the script. A lot of it is also carried over from Kep's previous draft, so I don't even know if town had to do that much once they're, once they're on top of the train. So uh, now at the end, after the, all that stuff, Claire is still alive. So after Ethan uses the gum and blows up the helicopter, he goes back into the train car and is reunited with Claire. She embraces him and they leave together. Now, walking towards the French opening of the channel with all the other passengers, he tells her Phelps is dead. She apologizes, and he tries to move on without her. She claims that when she first refused to betray Ethan, Phelps threatened to kill her and her family. But he's not having any of it. She begs him and kisses him, and then it seems like he's finally appearing to respond. And she says, I love you so much. This goes on for a while, and <laughs> it's like too long. And then he says, uh, tell me, Claire, how ashamed do you feel about Jack? He says that Phelps couldn't have committed all the murders and that Jack was hers. She had to have killed Jack. And she pleads with him saying, oh, you know, they'll, they'll lock me up forever. It's not fair. Jim got to me when I was 18. I never had a chance, which is, ooh, probably. I mean, it's their yeah. age gap is pretty in the final movie. Pretty, pretty icky, too. Yeah. <laughs> uh, OK, so um, then Kittredge approaches and says, you put on a hell of a show, Ethan. But Mrs. Phelps got a little lost in the shuffle. What was her part in the program? And Ethan says... Ethan says, Mrs. Phelps was Mrs. Phelps all the way. Ooh. So Claire's Ooh. devastated. And then Ethan says, If they give you 20 years, I'll wait for you, Claire. If it's more, well, I'll wait as long as I can. Oh. So he's going to try to wait for her. I hate this. I hate all this stuff. <laughs> you know, in Kep's previous draft, he had kind of a similar... He had His line was, I'll wait for you, baby. And that was it. I like the idea of him figuring out that she killed Jack. That's kind of interesting. Yeah. And fun. Yes. But the, but the way it is in the final movie is so much better because that's the question that, that drives the whole third act is Ethan's trying to find out. And he figures it out by tricking her with the mask play, you know? Yeah. I think it's, it's so much better the way it is in the final movie. Anyway, so then after all that, there's a whole page of dialogue where Kittredge asks Ethan how he figured out that it was Phelps. And Ethan explains everything. Definitely overkill. <laughs> 
Then there's the final bit of dialogue between Kittredge and Ethan with one line from Max too. Do you want to be Kittredge or Ethan? I'll be I'll be Kittredge. All right. Okay. You'll have plenty of time to fill me in later, Ethan. Congratulations on one hell of a job. Who said? Who said what? Who said I'd fill you in later? I misjudged you, Ethan. You're a good guy. I misjudged you, Kittredge. You're a real shit. <laughs> Stop kidding yourself, Ethan. Wake up. The name of the game's deceit and betrayal. Conscience has to be sacrificed if you're going to play it. I gave you my conscience for my country a long time ago. Think that's a joke? Ethan's broken into something approaching raucous laughter. A pretty good one. Sorry, I seem to have missed the punchline. You can't give up what you never had. And Kittredge, Pinocchio had more a conscience without Jiminy Cricket. So what are you saying? I quit, asshole. Max, in six months, this guy will have you on the payroll. Maybe not for a hundred mil, but a good two or three. Appreciate the sentiment, dear boy. <laughs> We're killing you, this. You, <laughs> you can't quit. No one ever quits. You'll be back, Hunt, whether you like it or not. And that is the ending of the town draft. Him, him walking away and kids shouting after him. Pretty interesting. Uh, and then that is very different from Kep's previous draft which has Ethan tell off Kittredge, but he doesn't quit. He says, I'm not going anywhere. There is a job to be done, and I'm not leaving it to you. Then it cuts to Ethan back on the farm with his extended family and neighbors, and they're having a picnic. Ethan's talking to his aunt about how he's going back to school, and then a couple of cars quickly pull into the driveway. Instead of joining the party, though, the driver of the first car leaves it there and gets into the other car, which drives off. So Ethan excuses himself from the party, walks over, and gets into the car. The keys are in the ignition, and there's a CD in the glove compartment by the band Suicidal Tendencies. Ethan puts in the CD, uh, he puts it in the CD player, and Kittredge's voice comes on, good morning, Mr. Hunt. And then that was the ending of David Kep's December draft before this one. I mean, the, the, the ending, the, the previous Kep ending and the final movie ending aren't terribly dissimilar. No. Uh, especially in tone and intent. Um, yes. Yeah. But probably a lot cheaper to use that little airplane set and just do that quick, quick little scene. Well, I mean, it's more uh, kind of economical. And I, I, yeah, I, I think uh, it's great. You don't have yeah. to have a whole bunch of extras, a bunch of cars and all this other stuff to coordinate. You just, yeah, just shoot them on the airplane. And it's a, mir and a great mirror of the opening with Phelps on the plane and the code with the flight attendant. Yeah. So that's it. Parting thoughts? Uh, not crazy about it. Um but I'm sure town made a million dollars or something on it. So, I mean, who's <laughs> laughing now? Yeah. All right. So that's, uh, I guess that's it. Um, I want to credit our uh, music composer, Kevin Blumenfeld, and also our editor and mixer, Luke Burson. And uh, say thank you to everybody. Tell everybody to sign up for our Patreon at patreon.com slash light the fuse. We do bonus episodes every week. There's also higher level uh, Patreon uh, that you can do, where you can join us for our monthly Zoom chats and, and all kinds of other stuff, please sign up for the Patreon. Also, uh, get a shirt or a magnet or a pin from our T Public store, which is linked from our website, lightthefusepodcast.com, under the merch tab. Also, go to the uh, episode guide tab and just check out all of our old episodes. Check out the show notes for all those episodes. It's a great visual companion to all of this. And come back for the 200th episode, because you will not be disappointed. Next week is going to be insane. Just you wait. Uh, anything else, Drew? Yeah, I want to encourage people to follow us on social media at Light the Fuse Pod on Instagram and Twitter. And to uh, like, subscribe, rate, and review wherever you're listening to this podcast. And Charles is absolutely right. For the first time in his life, he's just unequivocally <laughs> correct in the fact that our 200th episode, LTF 200, is going to be outstanding. I just can't wait for everybody to hear it. I am really proud of it, and um, again, we didn't do anything <laughs> it's all because of the people who were on it, but yeah. it's really great. We, but we did we we made two hundred cool cool ass episodes. So. Yes, this has been an amazing ride, and I'm yes. so proud of the work we've done and and all the amazing people we've been able to talk to. And um, look on the episode guide because I'm sure we're gonna put up there you know the other episodes with the various screenwriters we've talked to and various versions of the script. So yeah, listen to this, and then listen to those, and come back next week. It'll be great. <laughs>
thanks again for listening, everyone. Before we go, another mission, should you choose to accept it, please rate, review, and subscribe wherever you listen to podcasts. And remember that you can follow us on Twitter and Instagram at LightTheFusePod, and email us questions or comments at LightTheFusePodcast at gmail.com. This message will self-destruct in five seconds.